One of the drawbacks of having a regular Q&A session every afternoon is that people are expected to have questions, or at least they say, think they're expected to have questions. And so they just start thinking up random questions for the sake of having a question, or for the sake of drawing out the Q&A session so you don't have to work. That's not what it was like when I was with the John Fuang. If I had a question, he was happy to answer it. But if I came up with a question just for the sake of having a question, he would be pretty curt and cut it off. And many times I'd find that he was encouraging me to ask my own questions and answer my own questions. If I didn't put any effort into trying to find an answer myself. He felt he was teaching me to be lazy, so it was only when I had tried to think through an answer and I really couldn't come to one. That's when I would ask. And the reason we have the Q&A session is because for a lot of you, this you hear for just a very short time, so we open the opportunity. It was the same when I was in France. We had lots and lots of questions. I'm going through the transcript right now, and it's overwhelming the amount of questions. But I felt I was going to be there only for a few days, and who knows when I'm going to go back to France. So here was the chance. But the ideal attitude toward questions in your practice is one, if there's anything you genuinely don't understand after trying to understand it, you ask questions. That's in terms of what, what the teachings are saying. And then secondly, when you come up with the issue in your own mind. How do you bring it to stillness, and how do you develop dispassion? Those are the two big questions of the meditation. The first one has to do, of course, with getting the mind concentrated. How do you center it? How do you get it to indulge in its concentration? In other words, learning how to enjoy it at the same time that you're not getting carried away by the pleasure. In other words, you have to learn how to focus on the breath, but not get waylaid by the fact that there's a nice, pleasant sensation coming up, and either getting excited about it or just wanting to wallow in the pleasure. You've got to learn, learn how to ask the right questions. What to do with that pleasure? See it as a tool, or see it as a resource that you can use for the purpose of further concentration. And John Lee gives a lot of good examples for breathing in a way that gives rise to pleasure, and then seeing how that sense of pleasure can spread through the different parts of the body. So that as you expand your range of awareness, the pleasure expands as well. You have a genuine sense of fullness as you're sitting right here. That's something you want to develop, something you want to maintain. So that's the next question. Once you've got it, how do you maintain it? Because it's in the maintaining that actually makes a concentration. We can detect as we go through the day different states of mind that are formless. In other words, you're not clearly aware of the form of your body inside here because you're often a more spacious or just a sense of awareness. They don't last very long, though. And to get them to last long, you have to go through the steps. Otherwise, it's like trying to jump up to the fourth or fifth story of a building without going up the staircase. You can jump up to that level if you're really good, maybe, but you can't stay there. You come back down again. So the question is, how do you take what concentration you've got and develop it so you can stay with it and maintain it in spite of the sound of the crickets in the background? or maintain it in spite of the pain in the body, the pains that come up in the course of sitting here still. So these are questions you should be asking yourself about getting the mind into concentration. As for trying to get some discernment, these questions are not totally unrelated. The discernment questions have more to do with seeing things as fabrications, in other words, seeing the intentional element that goes into 
what you're creating here. And that's right here with the breath. The breath itself is a type of fabrication. Your direct of thought and evaluation around it, that's verbal fabrication. The feelings of pleasure and the perceptions you hold in mind about the breath, those are mental fabrication. So the question is about discernment, or how to view them in the way that gives rise to dispassion. Of course, this doesn't mean just trying to drop them immediately as soon as you close your eyes. First, you've got to get the mind into concentration. In other words, you use the fabrications and try to get a sense of the mind as still as possible. And then when it's still, you try to maintain it. And then you look for any ups and downs in that level of stillness, in the level of ease and the level of fullness, or whatever it is that's pleasant about the meditation. And try to become aware. What are you doing when the stress goes up? What are you doing when the stress goes down? That's actually applying the Four Noble Truths. In other words, if there's a rise in the stress, what are you doing? What's the cause? When the stress happens to go away, what did you do? What's the cause there? Now, you don't have to get into a lot of the technical details of the terms and everything, but that's one of the main questions you ask yourself. Okay, When the stress goes up, what did you do? When it goes down, what did you do? Can you catch these movements of the mind? And how are you going to catch them if the mind isn't really still? It's in this way that concentration and discernment have to go together. And when the Buddha is teaching, his prime topic of con concentration, his prime topic of meditation, it's the breath. And when you're doing the breath according to his steps, you're on the one hand trying to calm things, which is what tranquility or calm is all about. And at the same time, you're trying to see things as fabrication so that ultimately you can develop dispassion for them. But those steps leading to dispassion, they're not right at the beginning. First, you learn how to sensitize yourself to the different types of fabrication going on, and then you try to get a sense of well-being, a sense of fullness, because the mind is not going to calm down without that sense of fullness, sense of satisfaction. It's going to be hungry, and if it can't get any nourishment from this concentration, it's going to think about all kinds of other things. So the question is, as you're settling down with the breath, what would be a gratifying way of breathing? What would be a gratifying way of thinking about the breath? In other words, reminding yourself that you're not here just pumping away in, out, in, out, in, out. You're nourishing the organs of the body. Ask yourself which parts of the body seem to be tired, which parts are deprived of breath energy. Can you breathe in a way that allows those to gain some energy? to feel soothed by the breathing process. It becomes a gratifying way of thinking about the breath. And that allows it to calm down. Once it's calmed down, then you start asking those questions about this process of fabrication that you just did. Okay, where is it still lacking? Where is it still not as fully skillful as possible? The question here is, can I see even more subtle levels of stress. And that requires that you get even more still. It's not like trying to listen to some music far away. If you're not still, if you're moving around and fidgeting, you're not going to hear the far away music. But if you get very, very still, you can hear it. So if you want to see what's going on in the mind, first you have to be very still and learn how to be continuously still. And then you have to learn how to ask the right questions. How to get it more still, then how to see things in terms of fabrication, i.e. your intentions, and the role they play in your breathing and in your thinking and your perceiving and your feeling. How can you master that so it's skillful, and then how can you develop even more refined taste as to, or more refined standards for what really is skillful? What you're going to accept as the kind of 
pleasure that you feel is really what you're after. Because for a lot of us it's just, well, I'd like a little bit of rest, I'd like a little, little bit of stress reduction. But the Buddha was really demanding. He wanted something that was better than that. Deathless pleasure. And you're not going to find it anywhere else. You have to look right here. So look here continually and get the mind still. And see if you can ask the right questions. Because it's that combination of careful looking and knowing how to ask the right questions, that issue of appropriate attention. That's how the Buddha defines appropriate attention, is learning how to focus on the right questions and put aside irrelevant questions. That's when you see things you didn't see before. Everything you need to see is right here, but your mind is fidgeting too much. And it's not asking the right questions. That's why it doesn't see. So try to narrow the issues down to these two big ones. Gaining more stillness and understanding the processes of fabrication. That's when the things that are here will open up and show themselves.